So, ever so briefly, um, some colleagues may know that uh, about four years ago, the Welsh Government decided to make Wales a nation of sanctuary. This is something which um, I feel really proud of the Welsh Government for doing because their, their policy, their ideas, are in complete contrast really to the UK Westminster Government, which doesn't really support the idea of sanctuary in the way the Welsh Government does. Back in uh, 2018, 2019, we applied from the University of South Wales to become a University of Sanctuary. And fortunately, uh, we got the award. We became a University of Sanctuary. And this um, was awarded to us for the things that we've tried to do, which made the university think all the time about issues surrounding migration, forced migration, and for people who are in the asylum process. Now, if you have refugee status. It means you can get student finance, you can go on and, and um, do a degree or a master's degree the same as anybody else in, in, in Wales, whether you're from Port Albert or Swansea or whatever. But what you can't get funding for is for language education to help you overcome that barrier. And so um, USW, University of South Wales launched a, a refugee sanctuary scheme which pays for intensive, full-time language education courses for any refugee who wants to start studying in the university but doesn't have the language level required. We've written reports for Universities UK about the importance of universities providing language education. And we've written reports to Welsh Government on what are the barriers that somebody new in Wales faces when they want to, to try to enter employment. So by researching and by doing work in this area, we have a, a, a responsibility to challenge any misconceptions about refugee issues. This is for 18, 2019, right? But the numbers haven't really changed year on year since then. If you look at the left of the graph, you see Germany has the largest number, over 150,000 applications for asylum. Similar in France, Spain, and Italy. Economies and population sizes similar to the UK. The actual number for the UK, unsurprisingly, is on the far right. Far, far fewer. So, whoever said 30,000, well done. Far, far fewer than Germany, France, Spain, Greece, Italy, far fewer. And then, yet, the mainstream media, the government, the, 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 the press, and others believe it was Britain takes in far more people than other countries. Not true. So we've got a job to do. We, we, we have to challenge these misconceptions. And then there are other things that we can do as a university, such as um, design and launch as many participatory projects as we can. And what this does is allows researchers and lecturers and, and local people to come together with folks new to our community seeking sanctuary. And when the folks come together, of course, we create friendships, we break down misunderstandings, we, uh, we, we form bonds, and we basically are all enriched. Um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity, and thank you so much for, for coming. Um, I want you to imagine, uh, you just are a woman that forced to leave her country and he gathered all the strength that she had to come to another country and to save her life. But she couldn't do it without help. Imagine as she was alone, sitting in the room, couldn't speak English, she, she doesn't know anyone. What her love to be? Imagine there is no opportunity for the future. Imagine with all the trauma that she carried in her life and depression and disappointment. There is no hope. But, thank God, there is opportunity. And thank God that amazing people gathered together and that the magic all the people that's helping for the people, another woman like me, like the woman in the film, they came.
came for the hope and they find it without you, without the people that helped them, that showed them the future, give them the opportunity to show the potential that they carry, it's impossible. And thank you so much and thank God that I had this opportunity and I had this amazing time. Now I find a new life here. I find a new friend. I find a new com community. I find hope. I hope that I made my future here. And you are my family. And this is my country now. And I want to be accepted. And for the opportunity that's given to me, I will give it back to the society that I belong, and I will serve and help other people. And the life is not wasted anymore. Thank you so much for giving me.
the, the idea of walk and talk is to be outside, to be doing something, but also people are talking to each other. I, I speak to everybody on these trips, you know, just go from person to person, and we've all become friends, haven't we? So what's next? Um, the, everybody that took part in this, the feedback was that everybody gained from learning about each other's cultures. Um, what would we make? And from the English learners, from the refugees and asylum seekers, they said that they, they had found a confidence in speaking that they hadn't found in their traditional ESOL classes when they're learning grammar from a book. Um, so Mike and I have just received some key funding, not just, we've got some key funding to, to um, create and deliver some classes to ESOL teachers which talk about the participatory work that Mike does in workshops and the creative part of this that I try to add to this. Um, and we're delivering it from January next year, which I realize is next month. <laughs> but I was doing this before, I that's next month. And we're going to um, trial it with uh, third sector organizations like Oasis and Cardiff, which support refugees in this area, but also with um, Adult Women in Wales, who I think a lot of their work is about English language education now, isn't it? And they're crying out for this kind of um, training for their teachers to enhance what they do. And I, Mike and I, I think you'd agree with me, Mike, we're not trying to replace anything to do with traditional ESOL classes. What we're trying to do is just add to it and enhance it. Um, so I want to thank you for listening to me. I'm going to leave you with this lovely quote by Ellie Baker, who was um, actually a first year student when we started, and she's since graduated with a first class degree, and that's her lovely quote. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much everybody for coming here and giving me the chance to talk to you. Uh, in life we go through a lot of experience, bad experience, sad experience, and also a lot of happy experience. But I think the most painful experience that somebody may go through is to be forced to leave the country and be in the title of refugee. Is that a good experience at all? Uh, a few weeks ago, I met just by accident a gentleman from Ukraine. Um, he seemed to be very educated, uh, very nice, very kind. We talked about Ukraine and Syria, and he told me that I was following all the news, watching all the news about Syria since the problem started. But I didn't realize how bad it is, how painful it is to be a refugee until I'm in the same situation right now. That was really very bad experience for both of us. Always I look at the refugee as a tree which was deeply rooted in its country and has its own community living in a very healthy environment, but suddenly and forced to be eradicated and moved to another country and restart his life from the very, very beginning. But he's not going to be a tree anymore, he's going to be a city, a very small city that needs a lot of care until it gets adapted to the new environment. And that's really happened to me when I came here to Wales. I came here to Wales, I don't know about the rules, about the regulation, uh, about the accent that the people are speaking here, <coughs> about how to start a business, how to work, how to find my way. Everything was new because we are coming from a different country. But what compensates this pain that we feel as a refugee, as a civil seeker, is your care, what you have done for us, all of you, the community. And really, Wales was very good for me. The people were very kind. They were very supportive. And without them, I really, I, I, uh, my life would be very difficult. And now I'm here with my family, five kids and my wife. We start living our life here again. We are getting strong pain again. I'm doing my own business. My daughter is here to start university next year. My kids are uh, in the college. Some of them are in the school. They are having a lot of opportunity to, to pay back what they have given from this community. So we, we, all of us, I'm talking about by the name, by the help of all the refugees, we thank all of you because you really supported us and you give us the chance to start our life again. And for you being here in this evening, is a very big support. Thank you very much.
if you look at the title, Understanding and Supporting the Refugees, it's not a fragmented picture, right? It is a part of the whole world, the interconnectivity of the world and where they come from. So that's what I'll try to do today in my um, presentation to talk about that. Uh, so if, you, if I want to give you the perspective that it might ask you, like, you know, how many people seek asylum in this country, right? So the total number of refugees and asylum displaced people is almost 90 million people. Correct to you that by December, by in this Ju July, it has probably gone to one or three, but it hasn't transformed into the Global Trends Report, so I'm using the old report, so it's one year old by now. 90 million people are refugee and displaced, and among them, 27.1 million people are refugees, ne nearly 50 million people are like internally displaced people, and 4.6 million people are asylum seekers. It's a part of the whole game and all these things, so Interestingly, when you are focused on like this part of the world, this part of the world, high-income countries, Michael's comparing like the food as well, right? they only host 17% of the total refugees and displaced people. And they are the people who talk most. And they take most. The agenda, that's a global social policy. Most people are host. 82% people are hosted by low income, low middle income, and upper middle income countries. So pretty much lower upper middle income countries. Five countries <coughs> produce, if that is a word, my apologies. Most refugees, displaced people, come from five countries. Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Myanmar. The United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it says, for example, I thought it sometimes, and I, I wanted to remind myself, all humans are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The Sustainable Development Goals says that it wants to ensure all women can fulfill their potentials in dignity and rights, equality. Do we know about dignity? What does dignity mean? I do not know. Would a refugee dignity be any different from like a prime minister's dignity? Is my dignity equal to your dignity? Is Ukrainian dignity equal to Rohingya's dignity? Do we know? Do we need to know? How they want to be treated in the way, not many people know. Even the policymakers at the very top, even then. So it is assumed that dignity is taken for granted without any perspective. We wanted to highlight how these people perceive dignity. I'm not going to talk a lot, but this is something we wanted to highlight that these people are very, very capable of producing their own voice and own understanding of dignity. In terms of Rohingyas, safety comes first. For first of all, safety matters for them in terms of dignity. The philosophers talk about dignity being unalienated, inalienable, and all those things. When body parts, dead bodies are being mutilated, right? Where does dignity remain? That's questionable. So this was the acting assistant secretary for the Bureau of Population, Refugee, and Migration from the United States. She was saying, okay, and I read, my apologies. We come together to understand the international community's continued commitment to the humanitarian response and to comprehensive and sustainable solution for the refugees and host community members in Bangladesh and throughout the region as well as for their status and internal displaced in Rakhine State in Myanmar. Look, she was also seen really, really tight to sound pressure. She said, we must remember that each Rohingya, like each of us, they have hopes and dreams, memories, fears, family and friends. I don't know if she knew Muhammad before. It is impressive, it is imperative that we listen to their perspectives, amplify them, and respond to them in a way that recognizes their fundamental human dignity and desire to determine their own future. Let me show you what actually happened. In three hours video conference, they allowed a pre-recorded four minutes video that included four years. Two from Bangladesh, two were living overseas in Malaysia and elsewhere. One of them was a community worker. And she was telling that, look, we need to go back home. We really want to go back home. And I took the screenshot where they were subtitled it. So they could not see. They were still not so they did not see it. So she was talking that each day feels very long to us. One year feel like 10 years. We want to go back home. How can we go back to our village? Our homeland, 
We hear the same thing, and she was saying when she goes for community work, she hears the same thing. So that's one side of the perspective. So let me show you what the Bangladesh government said. Bangladesh government was represented by the state minister of like you know, So the state minister was literally reading, and he was saying Bangladesh is not in a position to continue to take this burden anymore. The Rohingyas must return, so that's similar to what Rohingya says. He also emphasizes the Rohingya themselves want to return to the homeland, and international community should sincerely work to create that opportunity for their return. And he finally concludes that international community has a responsibility to work with Myanmar to resolve the crisis and here they work. We leave Bangladesh from the burden that Myanmar has created. It's not our burden. The Bangladesh is not part of the country all of a sudden. So, what I was trying to show that of course these are the main stakeholders, the people who have been victim, and the country that is hosting them. Was there any doubt that they were not clear what they want? What happened in the meantime, what happened in the meantime, that the donors, they were nonchalant, reluctant, and many of them were silent. What I said, that we'll talk about other in the future. Right? So we know about like, where most people are coming from. Of course, I didn't include in that stack, that is what my stack, yeah, among the Ukrainians. Right? So Ukrainians, very next to us, they probably look many of like you. They share the common identity, Europeanness, whiteness probably, probably Christian identity. All the European countries have hosted, welcomed Ukrainians, and I have no issue for that. I need to say it very clearly. I understand that, hey, I hope I understand, I'm not sure. When Mama said, will I be able to understand unless I become a refugee, I don't know. But I do sympathize with them, equally, like refugees, like Rohingyas, and Syrians, and Ukrainians. But all support seems to like there is a double standard, the way we talk about refugees and asylum seekers. We are treating Ukrainians in one way, and the rest of the others, we are trying to treat differently. And this is from ODI, with all eyes on Ukraine, human rights support, to our own Africa crisis missing action. So it's not only in there, in other parts of the places too. Hopefully it shows that it is not the right way to move forward in understanding refugees and asylum seekers. And on that note, I'm going to conclude. But thank you very much for listening. Thank you.